Hello, good morning from a very brisk Brussels this morning. My name is Josh Fasan. I'm a senior reporter at Politico Europe. Welcome to our latest event, Driving Fossil Free Transport by 2050, From Words to Action, How to Make the High Ambition a Reality. Uh, this is obviously a perfect time to be discussing this topic, given what happened at COP in the last few days. We'll be discussing that more ju in just a few minutes. Um, let's start with the housekeeping news straight away. I'd like to thank our partner, Volvo Trucks, for making this event possible. Thank you to them. Thanks also to those in our audience with us here today and to those watching online. As ever, Politico likes to make its events as interactive as possible. That means you can tweet about it, at Live Politico for all your tweets. Also on Slido, you can pose a question the hashtag for that is uh, hashtag, obviously, driving fossil free. Uh, look forward to receiving your questions on that. We've got a few in already. Um, yeah, we also have a poll today, as we always do through Slido. The question from Volvo Trucks is, who has the main responsibility for speeding up the electrification of road freight transport? You can vote on Slido. We'll come back at the end. Spoiler, for now, national governments are by far, I think, the... the the, the person with the responsibility or the people with the responsibility for making that happen. Before we get into the chat with our special guest, Transport Minister of France, Jean-Baptiste uh, Jabari, we'll go to a video from Volvo Trucks uh, Executive Vice President um, and the President of Volvo Trucks, Roger Alm. He is taking the distancing rules very seriously. He sat in a truck outside first. We have a video from them, then we have a brief chat from him, and then we'll come back to the stage. Over to you guys. Road freight accounts for around 7% of the world's CO2 emissions. Consequently, the EU has set ambitious climate targets for the transport industry. One alternative for transporters is to invest in electric trucks. The total climate footprint of one electric truck can be nearly six times lower during its life cycle compared to a truck that runs on fossil diesel. Volvo Trucks has sold electric trucks since 2019. There are so many benefits and I like so many things with electrical trucks, but just mention a few of them. The truck is completely silent and is also not providing any vibration, but also the truck is then transporting goods with zero emissions. In 2021, the total market for heavy duty trucks in Europe will be around 280,000 trucks. But only a few hundred electric trucks above 16 tonnes have been registered so far this year. Why don't we see more electric trucks on European roads? One of the biggest concerns from transport operators is the lack of green energy and charging infrastructure. PostNord, one of the largest logistics solutions providers in the Nordic region, has recently started to invest in electric trucks. We can't do it alone. We have to jointly move forward here. Companies, governments, to ensure the transformation as quickly as possible. We'll take our part and do our role in this. But we need more energy and we need green energy. We need charging infrastructure. We have to act and we have to act now. DFDS, a leading shipping and logistics operator in Northern Europe, has also started to invest in electric trucks. They express similar concerns. For us to speed up the electrification, we need support. We need support to build more infrastructure that needs to be support from governments, from customers, from suppliers. We need to help each other, we need to have a partnerships. We can help our customers on the way to a greener supply chain and we can, together with partnerships, make it a greener world. I think the whole transformation is moving too slow. We all need to come together to make this happen a lot faster and a lot quicker than we are doing today. And that is so important that we do that for ourselves, for the climate, for the world, and also then for the future generation. Hello everyone. My name is Roger Alm. I am the president of Volvo Trucks. And I'm very pleased to be here with you today in Brussels. Right now, I'm sitting inside our biggest electric trucks the Volvo FH Electric. And I would like to invite you all to take a ride in this truck after the event. It is a fantastic experience, I can promise you that. Volvo Trucks has the biggest range of heavy electrical trucks worldwide. 
but the market is growing too slowly today. One reason is that our customers need charging solutions. Trucks like this are too big to use the same charging equipment as for passenger cars. As a truck manufacturer, we are doing our part. We include, for example, portable charging equipment when we are delivering the truck. And we will invest in at least 1,700 high-performance charging stations throughout Europe. But this is not enough. We need many more charging points already today. And remember, heavy trucks are very different from passenger cars in many ways. They are commercial vehicles and need to roll day and night to deliver them the goods in time. Fast, fast charging adapters for heavy trucks is therefore essential. I believe the transformation is moving too slowly. So my questions to all of you today is, how can we together speed up the building of charging infrastructure for heavy electrical trucks? Back to you, Josh. Thank you, Roger. And now let's accelerate with our one-on-one -on -one interview with French Transport Minister Jean-Baptiste Jabari. Welcome. Thank you. It's a little bit cold in here, isn't it? Yeah, it so is. It is chilly. Let's heat it up a bit. <laughs> but it's a pleasure to be with you, Josh. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you here. So you were just meeting Transport Commissioner Valian in the Berlimont uh, a few metres away. What did you talk about? We discussed about decarbonisation of uh, air transport. So we discussed uh, sustainable aviation fuel. We discussed a new generation of uh, low carbon and zero emission aircraft and all what we can do in the context of the French presidency coming uh, next year. Yeah, and so you have just a few weeks to go until that starts. What are going to be the strategic priorities of the French government? What is your job going to be when you're leading this, this policy drive? Uh, in a nutshell, main priorities are decarbonisation of all transport sectors, and we'll get back to that in a minute, I guess. Uh, of course, uh, social regulation, it's a big topic in, uh, in the, the transport sector as well, and innovation, because uh, at the end of the day, what uh, we need is to invest a lot on innovation to make that happen. Uh, we discussed the, uh, the charging points, for example, uh, and it's moving quite fast. Uh, just one figure in France for the light vehicles, uh, at the beginning of the year, January 1st, we were having 400,000 charging points. We will get to a million at the end of this year. And ov obviously the, the trend will be uh, massively increasing over the, the years to come. So it's a, it's a good momentum. And at the same time, we are living a, a very deep economic crisis for the sector mm. and a very, very fast technological transformation. So all of that happening at the same time, it's quite of a challenge. Yeah, it's a really revolution at the moment. But let, let's, let's start with the big show, which is the Fit for 55 package. Now we'll get onto charging infrastructure specifically in a minute. Let's just talk about ETS for road. This is a very contentious topic. Obviously the French government feels very strongly about this because of the Yellow Jackets protests. What is your position on expanding ETS to the road transport sector? Well, more than a position. We are acting at national level and, and we want to expand that at European level. What we are doing, uh, we met with the, uh, all stakeholders from the, uh, the industry, the road transport industry and, and, and stakeholders, and we said, first, exactly as we did for the, for the road uh, and for the light vehicles, we need to uh, somehow get to a common understanding on where is the technology and where we are going in terms of, uh, of uh, truck offers, because uh, basically all the unions, for example, all the the, the, the stakeholders were saying there is no offer available at the moment. And if there is, it's not French or it's not European. And we, we've lived that before when we started uh, renewables, for example. And eventually we started to import uh, Chinese renewables equipment. So we don't, in a way, we don't want that to happen. And we want to uh, impose new regulation when the market is mature in terms of, uh, of offer. So I'm very pleased to see that Volvo Trucks is going uh, quite well in developing their offer. And it's going quite fast because uh, this year only, uh, I've seen in many, many events and occasions, uh, light trucks, heavy trucks to be developed. And uh, we are pretty much the same situation five years ago for the light vehicles, where we were saying it doesn't exist. And uh, if it does exist, it's just for urban and, and last mile. Um, perspective or, or usage. So it will, it will be very fast. And in a way, it's still really open from the technologic per, technological perspectives uh, between hydrogen, uh, battery, battery ele electrical equipment. So, so it's an exciting time and, and things are moving fast. But, but what about extending, what, what about charging drivers a little bit more money in order to green up the economy? I mean, the emissions trading system is about that. Yeah. 
Again, we need the technology and we need the offer. So the, the, renewable, uh, the, the renewable of the equipment is possible for, for the stakeholders. Then uh, we need charging points. And that's a challenge. I was saying for light vehicles, we, we get to that number in France, but uh, it's, it's an ongoing uh, uh, challenge. And we need to achieve that at Euro European level, because uh, by definition, it's long distance uh, um, travels that we are trying to accommodate. And then we need financial aid. At the moment, uh, the cost the other cost is, uh, is big. It's mm. between 50% um, and 150% and of the fossil, f fossil fuel equipment. So we need to, if, if we are able to achieve that all at the same time and to give predictability, visibility to the sector, I'm sure acceptability of the uh, ETS transport may be, may be possible. But okay. uh, that's a prerequisite, so to say. So it may be possible if there's lots of other stuff as well, like charging if you have, uh, Absolutely. Okay, understood. So we're going to get on to the other stuff now, actually. Uh, an equally um, sensitive topic is the phase-out of the internal combustion engine for cars and vans. 2035 is when the EU Commission and many member states want that to be. What's the French government's position? Uh, so we passed a law back in 2017 or 2018 uh, saying 2040 for now. We, in 2018, we said uh, it's going to be the end of uh, fossil fuel cars in France uh, by 2040. Then there is a discussion. Uh, shall we uh, include a hybrid plug-in, for example? Shall we not? How the market is driving the, the, the change? And what I'm seeing is the market is driving the change very drastically and very quickly. Uh, we have seen the uh, announcement for all car manufacturers. They are very, very big, and like just for France. Uh, right now, we have uh, 600,000 el electrified cars. It's going to be 3 million in 25, 10 million in 2030, 21 million, so half of the existing fleet mm. in 2035. So and all, all the financial markets are financing it as well. So I'm expecting, personally, that things are going to happen much quicker than expected. So it's going to be a discussion regarding the date, but the revolution is, uh, is on the way, and that's what's matters from a climate. So 2035 could be possible for the French government. Obviously, you one of the first movers in discussion. Europe. Okay, so it's, it's not a no, basically. There's a, a global discussion regarding the package. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, we think hybrid plug-in is a short-term solution uh, for, to decrease emissions, for example. So that's not nothing. And that's a transition. So we need to uh, allow for the appropriate time for the market to pick up. So there's yeah. a discussion at global level. I, I take what you say, but I, I just wonder that we're very clear now we have to cut transport emissions by 90% by 2050. Everybody's agreed to do that. Mm. And the fleet turnover for vehicles is typically up to 15 years. So in order to get all the gas guzzling vehicles off the road, you need to set 2035 as an end date. Uh, but it seems there's a little bit of discussion whether or not plug-in hybrids could be sold later from your side. That would inevitably mean people in the 2040s would be forced to give up their car or you would still have dirty vehicles on the road. Again, there's a political dis discussion uh, for the, the months to come, and there is, a, again, an ongoing revolution. So, and that's what, that what matters. And so what we need to do uh, as national governments for now, uh, of, of course we need to, to discuss about the date, but we need to accelerate the deployment of charging points, we need to accelerate um, uh, to combine or to, 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 to allow for a European offer to emerge and, and to be available for, for customers. And we need to somehow allow for uh, the middle class uh, to access that sort of cars because it remains quite, quite expensive at the moment. And even in France, all combined, when you get all the financial aid, you, get to, uh, you can get to 19,000 euros to buy a new car. Uh, but still, people are, are, some of the people from, 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 from the middle class are not able to, uh, to, 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 the, to do that. So we need to take that into account, social acceptability, and that's very, very fast transportation is key. Yeah, and, and it, in that, that note, do you think purchase subsidies are gonna be something we'll see in, in European markets like France for a very long time then? These aren't a temporary fix uh, stimulus for the Yeah, we've seen that during the uh, recovery plans. I mean, uh, pretty much uh, all uh, European countries, they somehow uh, provided aid to, uh, to purchase uh, low emissions vehicles. So. And it's maybe to be, uh, to be extended uh, and to, to find a, a framework at European level. That's what we want to achieve. And on trucks, the European Commission is going to announce new uh, emission reduction targets for trucks and heavy duty vehicles next year. What's the French government's position on that file? High ambition, also setting a, a phase out date, a band date? Again, high ambition and uh, acceptability and, and technical availability of uh, what we are saying. Uh, we need to 
to do that in the right order. We, we, we can't start by the standard if the offer is not right or, or not available, or if we have to import, again, as we did before in other sectors, uh, the technologies. So there's also, we need to combine the climate ambitions and some sort of uh, economic and, uh, and industrial sovereignty on, on that matter, because it's a new industry emerging, mm. so we want to be part of it. And when, uh, as Europeans, I'm saying, uh, so we need to, to combine all those factors. They are not, uh, it, it, it's, it is combined that we're trying to, to, to win that, uh, that uh, war against uh, climate change. And coming on to the alternative fuels infrastructure regulation, a file you're going to have a lot to do with in the six months at the beginning of next year. Uh, there was always a lot of conversation about the chicken and egg dilemma. What had to come first, the clean vehicles or the infrastructure? That seems to now be a thing in the past. Everyone agrees that everybody has to see the infrastructure there in the first place. As the French government, are you willing to accept binding targets on an EU level for rollout of what you do domestically? Well, I, I think... What, what's happening at the moment at French level, we are developing, as I was saying, uh, or deploying charging points. There, there are different subjects. Uh, we were saying one million at the end of the year, most of them, they are located uh, at home or uh, in, in the local companies. Uh, what we need to achieve, we need to achieve confidence and people, if they are not feeling that they can travel more than 300 kilometers and, and find the right uh, charging points, they won't adopt the uh, electric vehicles or, or low emissions vehicles. So we need to achieve that. Uh, so that's the work we're doing in, uh, in long distance um, motorways, for example, or uh, uh, to, to allow for people to be confident in long distance travels. Then there is the big topic of uh, recharging in, uh, in, in cities. Uh, and uh, that's where it's the most complicated because different business models, because different technolo technological options. And everyone is doing in Europe is doing the same uh, work at, at the same time. So it needs to converge at some point at European level. We're still discussing the, the criteria, the technological criteria. We're based on the 2014 figures and obviously endurance of cars have improved drastically uh, and the level of equipment regarding the available electrical, electrical cars, electric cars in, in the market needs to be uh, taken into account. So um, we need to push at national level and, and at some point to converge, uh, to converge at European level for sure. I, I see, but if, if France is high ambition on cleaning up transport, why not accept binding targets from the European Commission so that everybody's on the same page, everyone knows where all the other countries are going to? We just need to agree on the criteria. Uh, okay. At the moment, what I'm seeing is uh, we are uh, using uh, uh, criteria from you know, 2014, which are not up to date. So there is a work to actually enhance or improve or update those criteria, and that's uh, a good work. And in, in the six months that you're going to be in charge of steering transport uh, policy in the council, how much progress do you think you can make on AFIA specifically? Can mm -hmm. you get a general approach? I mean, the Slovenians might do in December. If not, is it up to you? Well, um, maybe two, two options there. Uh, it, it makes sense to uh, conclude the package, because uh, everything is, uh, is, is tight, so to say. Uh, and at the same time, if we can move ahead and, and, and move uh, quicker than expected on the, on the transport package, let's, uh, let, let, let's, let's that be an option. It will be discussed again, but uh, by definition or by uh, attitude, uh, I'm, also, I'm always willing to, to, to go fast. So. Okay. Let's switch to aviation, because this is obviously a very touchy subject in terms of uh, CO2 emissions now. Uh, France got a lot of attention for banning short-haul flights in places where you could take the train two and a half hours. Of course, that is a very flashy policy when you see it on the face of it, but research suggests only five of 108 domestic routes will be affected. Uh, it only reduced emissions by six, five, six percent. And should this be strengthened? If, for example, when you look at routes even within Europe, I know not to the EU these days, but there are five Air France direct flights a day from Paris to London. I mean, this isn't really in line with our ambition to reduce flights over relatively short distances easily accessible by train. Well, in France, what we, so we've, we've developed uh, quite a big network of high-speed trains. And when you have a competition between the rail, the high-speed rail uh, and the planes, the rail wins. We opened in 2017 uh, the, um, the line between Paris and Bordeaux two hours and four minutes, and uh, in six months, 60% of the market share of aviation went to the train. So when there is a competition and you have a, a strong high-speed alternatives, you can see that the market itself is doing it uh, very well and very fast. There is no more, nearly no more flight between Paris and Strasbourg, Strasbourg for example. We all take the trains, and that's good. So uh, competition, most of the time, high-speed train wins. 
And then it's a question uh, also of allowing innovation to develop. We, we can see that uh, the, 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 the greener aircraft, the low carbon, zero emission aircraft, the segment on which they will develop are regional air traffic. So if we want to allow for the new generation of low carbon and zero emission aircraft to actually be a, a, a European asset in the context of decarbonization, we also need to uh, have them experimented uh, in regional routes. So it's, again, it's a bit of a combination and, and a balance to achieve there. Just on rail quickly, do you believe there should be competition against Eurostar on the Channel Tunnel route? Mm, in a way that... Because if competition is good, then, oh, yes. me, then having more trains running through the tunnel okay, potentially right, to okay, new destinations would be good. To be honest, uh, uh, liberaliz liberalization in, in, of transport that we've seen uh, for, the, for, the, for the last uh, 25 years now will get to a point where we can be critical about what is working and what is not working. So uh, Germany, for example, has liberalized uh, train, the train sector, passenger train sector uh, since 1994. So we can see where we're going now. Um, and on very dense traffic, I'm not so sure that all, at all times uh, competition is good. So I'm not taking position on, on the Eurostar and, and, Libra and competition, but what I'm seeing, and also uh, we are looking what the, the Brits are, are, are doing in, in the Greater London, for example. They've tried pretty much every different models, and uh, so now they may, may be getting to something interesting. So. Again, uh, competition is not good in itself. It, it, it's good if it, if it benefits to, uh, to passenger and users. For example, we, opened, uh, we liberalized regional train uh, in France, and we can see that uh, around Marseille and Nice, you get uh, twice as many uh, passenger traffic uh, than before. So in a way, that, that's beneficial to users, so that's good. <coughs> and some other areas, you, you can see that very high density uh, areas, competition is not always yeah. to the benefit of users, so we have to be very pragmatic about that. So just staying on, on rail before we head back to aviation to close off, the favourite topic for a lot of people in Brussels these days, sometimes also myself, are night trains. This is something that you've seen a resurgence across Europe, and you yourself have been partly responsible for reopening night train routes in France. But the question isn't just about the routes, right? If these are old crusty carriages that we used 20, mm. 30 years ago, nobody wants to ride them. Absolutely let alone sleep on them. So is it not a question about people investing, governments making money available to invest in new rolling stock? Or will the French government look into doing this? Okay, I, th I think you're right. I mean, we, we've been reopening two night trains, lines, uh, Paris to Nice, and we will be doing uh, Paris to Tarbes at the end of the year. We are reopening or opening Paris to Vienna at the end of the year. We want to open Paris to Berlin. So there's a, there is a push uh, and there is a, there is a will, f especially from the younger population, to actually travel by the night train. We need to also update the business models because you're right to say that uh, uh, the, 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 the quality of service is not great. So rolling stock, we've been running a study uh, that will be published uh, by the end of the year to see if at the French or a European level, but we prefer European level, uh, we can uh, get to some sort of uh, European Roscoe to finance the, the running stock. And I think that's a good way to do it because the, the Swiss, uh, the Germans, the, the, the Spanish, uh, pretty much all the uh, European countries are interesting and, and needing, uh, and needing uh, uh, to update their running stock. So. I, I know a few people that will be very, very happy to hear you say that. <laughs> uh, just finally on the, the short haul flight ban, would you also like to see this in a European solution? Would you talk to your colleagues over the six months that you're running the council meetings about potentially thinking of a European idea for a short haul flight, short -haul flight ban? Again, that's a question of balance. Uh, in France, we have a very specific rail network with a lot of uh, high-speed trains. Um, some of the colleagues approached me to, to understand what we're doing and how it uh, develops, so it's possible that we have the discussion, but uh, so far we have a national approach given the national railway network as well. Mm. On sustainable aviation fuels, is the level of ambition proposed by the European Commission in terms of 63% of total fuels being sustainable by 2050, is that enough? It's only 2% by 2025, 5% by 2030, doesn't sound like a lot, does it? Again, it's an emerging market. What we need to understand now, uh, where we can find the feedstock. I mean, when we talk SAF, we talk about uh, waste oil, we talk about uh, biomass-based uh, sustainable aviation fuel, we, we talk about e-fuels. And at the moment, the main questions are the capability to massify the production and the price. Right now, the price for a waste oil-based uh, 
SAF is three times more expensive than kerosene. Mm. If you go for biomass, it's five times more expensive. If you go for e-fuels based out of uh, hydrogen and CO2 recombine, it's 10 times more expensive. So at the end of the day, someone will pay. The passenger will pay. So again, it needs to be acceptable. Yeah. And at the same time, we need to drive the cost down. So i.e. all the standards that we can impose, massification of production, public support, etc. So it's, it's a big industry to uh, European industry to create. I think there's a, a huge potential there. But and, that and needs to be... It's going to be the passenger that pays. It's not going to be something that governments, like the French government, can subsidise in the medium term. At the end of the day, when you have the crisis that we lived, when you have uh, more and more tax or compensation, ETS, uh, some, some people are, are talking about uh, taxing the kerosene, uh, the SAF in itself, they will always cost more than kerosene. So at the end of the day, we can expect uh, that uh, the price of the tickets may increase. Uh, and also because we are living a, a very, very strong, times for the, uh, strong time for the aviation sector. We, we can uh, make the uh, assumption that uh, maybe at some point there will be a consolidation of the market. So it's not impossible that the, the prices go up. So we need to allow for everything. At, again, at the, same t at, at, the, at the end of the day, it's about social acceptability. If the middle class realize in five years that uh, they are not able to travel anymore, uh, we're going to have a, a European problem, political problem this time. So we need to be uh, careful with uh, what we are yeah. doing. In Pe terms of people like their cheap holidays, right? People, they like to travel. They love the freedom of traveling. I'm not sure about cheap holidays. The low-cost carriers have a lot of, lot of cash. They will continue to, 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 to fly. Mm -hmm. I'm not so much talking about low-cost carriers or uh, legacy carriers. I'm talking about the middle class. that want to travel maybe once a year or, or once every two years to visit their family and stuff. And, yeah. and, and so we need to be consequential in a way, in a way that we're doing the, everything. So some very quick fire questions for you. How soon until Airbus is able to deploy a zero emission passenger jet, do you think? So they are, they are saying the new generation of aircraft, it's uh, from 2033 onwards, but they are working on uh, electric and hybrid electric. Uh, for regional routes, a bit earlier than that. So we may have uh, demonstrators uh, around 25, 27, okay. that sort of... Uh, Hyperloop, would it ever happen in Europe? <laughs> I went uh, to visit Hyperloop two years ago. The technology, technology is great. Uh, then the operations, and uh, it uh, needs to allow for, for big volumes. And uh, I did, in a past life, uh, a study on that. And I found out that the uh, only available business case in Europe at the moment was uh, to create a hyperloop between uh, Paris Airport and Frankfurt Airport to create a big uh, European airport hub. A and the volume in terms of passenger traffic at the time was bringing uh, balance in terms of, uh, of business models. But uh, it's, a, it's, a big, it's, a, it's a very interesting technology. How long until you as a minister could sign off on the, on the case for that? Uh, for hyperloop? Yeah. There's a lot of safety concerns, potentially. There's, uh, we need to test the technology a bit more. Well, I, I have no clue about what would be a, 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 an appropriate timeline, but I guess, uh, I guess uh, five years is, uh, is something that uh, okay. is, is approachable in terms of regulations, security, safety, demonstrations. Bike or e-scooter? <laughs> well, I'm doing both. I prefer bike when available. Uh, E-scooters, they are getting more and more regulated, especially in Paris for mm. uh, speed for safety purposes. But I have to say that both are driving very, uh, very badly uh, in a way. So, so we need to educate people also, whether they're on bikes or e-scooters. That's true. And I'm That's true. Uh, and uh, finally, on this, uh, this topic, air taxis, you yourself, are, of course, are a pilot. Um, when do you anticipate you'll be able to, to fly in a zero emission air taxi over the, the skies of Paris? Well, we want to inaugurate a, a Vertiport in Pontoise at the end of the year, and we are expecting the Olympics in 24 in Paris to be a, a, an interesting moment to, to try uh, and develop uh, pre-commercial services, whether they are passenger services or freight services. So we're working on, on that at the moment. And they are also a good playground to test some uh, emerging technological bricks, so to say. So we are really interested in uh, eVTOLs in France. Okay, thank you. Just a final couple of questions on your broader profile, given that you've turned into something of a TikTok star in <laughs> France now. And I noticed on, on Twitter you're not that active, but on TikTok you're posting videos all the time. Where has this come from, and does your boss Emmanuel Macron know about this? <laughs> uh, I think he knows, um, but we haven't discussed the matter uh, lately. And it's good fun. Uh, the, the audience is, more, is younger than on other networks, and it's... Uh, 
I mean, Twitter is all about uh, hating each other and arguing with each, with each, each yeah, other. Is, so, yeah. and TikTok is, is is really interesting because the comments I have, uh, the direct messages I have, is uh, how do I become a transport minister? I never got that question before. And also because the message we are trying to convey regarding what we are doing, and uh, most of the people are saying, oh, if you haven't done that TikTok, I wouldn't know what we are doing. So uh, in a way, it's, good to, it's fun to do, and I think it's uh, somehow useful. So I guess the first step of, of becoming a transport minister is to win an election first. Speaking of, of your boss, Emmanuel Macron, is he going to run in the French presidential election next year? We assume he is, but he hasn't actually said it yet. So obviously I'm here to discuss that matter. I, I can say that I wish to, but he will, uh, he will say what he has to say uh, and in the appropriate timing. And, and a potential tilt for you in the future? You're appealing to the young generation now, maybe when they're voters and they're more infused about politics in the years to come. Could you potentially run one day? That's the secret plan, maybe. All right. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Scoop here. Thank you very, very much for taking more, more of your time than we expected today, but thank you uh, thank for you. being a good sport. Okay, thanks. Transport Minister Jibari, thanks. Thank you. Have a good day. Okay, guys, now we dive into our panel discussion a little bit later than anticipated. Uh, if I could ask our panel to come to the stage, we have three people with us here today. Uh, I'm not sure where they are. We have um, Marco, you there? Do you want to come on to the stage? Marco Joya, he's the Secretary General of the European Road Haulers Association. He's going to join us today on stage. Antonio Lopez Nicolas Baza, he's Deputy Head of Unit on Renewables and Energy System Integration Policy at DG Enna. That's a bit of a mouthful. Thank you for joining, Antonio. Over at Troyung, he's the Director of Green Mobility at French energy company Engie. And then joining us online, she's not quite on the screen yet, but I think she is there, Maya Bakran. Uh, she is, of course, a Deputy Director General at DG Move from the European Commission. <coughs> Hello, Maya. Can you hear me? Hi there. Loud and Hello. clear. Super. So, the Minister just came from a meeting with Valian. You have to run for a meeting with the Commissioner at 12. So, we're going to take as much of your time as possible before you have to run to that meeting. Uh, given what the Minister has said about his level of ambition on the Fit for 55 package, um, perhaps you can give us an update, Maya, on... DG Moves take specifically the pace of work on the files that you're monitoring most closely, which is sustainable aviation fuel uh, regulation, and then also the, the rules on the alternative fuels infrastructure regulation as well. Thank you very much, uh, Joshua, and uh, good morning to everybody. Indeed, uh, very encouraged by a very energetic uh, uh, interview you had with the minister. And as he said, uh, decarbonisation, social dimension, innovation, priorities for the incoming France, French presidency, fully, fully, fully in line with our priorities. So uh, as title uh, of, uh, <clears throat> of today's discussion is From Words to Action, it is crucial really to get from words to action, especially now after uh, all that happened, all that transpired at uh, COP26. So indeed, as, as everybody is fully aware, what we in the Commission and Digimove are trying to do is to translate it uh, into action, all these words, and also quite a few things that have been done and that we have achieved so far, uh, and uh, therefore the uh, Fit for 55 uh, package. I mean, how else are we going to reach this 90% reductions uh, in transport? So. Uh, here, really, it is a complex package uh, prepared by various services on the Commission. Of course, we as Digimove have uh, the three transport uh, proposals that you mentioned, but all are interlinked. Uh, I would really like to highlight, perhaps, uh, we, you already spoke about the ETS in transport, the major, major development. Let's also never forget the CO2 emission performance standards. They are key to innovate the fleet, and we see Europe-wide the surge in uptake of electric vehicles in 21, surge of 16%. Uh, chicken and egg, you mentioned it, infrastructure versus new vehicles. We really are convinced here in the Commission, and we are trying to really work with the member states, with the parliament, that finally we can get rid of this dilemma by investing in infrastructure. Necessary infrastructure must be provided. Uh, Another fact, the uh, number of registered vehicles in 2020 has doubled, yet at the same time, the number of new recharging points has only increased by 20%. But the time is now, and it is possible to really make this change. We've just heard Minister Jabari uh, 
in France from 400,000 charging points to 1 million at the end of the year. And this is doable and realistic at European level. Of course, we have a number of member states, we, we already feel it in, in, in discussions on AFIR in the Council, who are hesitant, perhaps uh, also looking into the cost. But let me also clearly say that a number of this in big parts of this investment will come from European budget. We are very much encouraged by National Recovery Resilience Plans. A lot of them envisage quite some tens of thousands of charging points. And we, of course, will also, uh, uh, in addition, finance from uh, uh, Connecting Euro Facility, also cohesion structural funding. So this is exciting times. Things are changing. And I really, all of us here are quite convinced that we can achieve a lot in a, in a, in a relatively short time. We'll see big, big, big changes over the next years. Having said that, Let's also never forget, nothing will happen overnight. Minister Jabari was also talking about it. We do have a period ahead of us until 35, until 50. So we are talking about 30 years of transition. So let's also be aware when we talk about all the social issues, we do have sufficient time to, uh, to sort it out. Okay, thank you, Maya. And, and of course, we have 30 years, but we need to get cracking now, as everybody constantly yeah. says. In terms of the work on the Fit for 55 package, are you happy with the European Parliament's progress so far? You mentioned the Council. I wonder if MEPs, they, they've just finished squabbling about who gets control of which file. Are they moving quickly enough now? Well, I'll be very frank. Uh, personally, I'm a little bit disappointed with the uh, current dynamic in the parliament. We were hoping to progress faster. At this stage, I have to say, council has progressed much faster than the parliament. Having said that, uh, I'm equally, <clears throat> I, I, I really believe that this initial slow dynamic in the parliament will uh, speed up. And uh, we are also inviting the colleagues, uh, all the uh, members of European parliament to uh, 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 to speed it up. So uh, I can only say that I hope we'll see uh, changes in the dynamic and the parliament will catch up. And then as parliament uh, often does, will actually in the end be pushing the council to uh, reach an agreement. Uh, uh, it was already mentioned by the minister. It is a complex package, but we need to really, uh, once we establish full understanding, which, once each and every member state, uh, parliament understand all the intricacies, all the interlinkages, then we will simply have to move ahead and we'll have uh, what I see uh, a, a sort of a regatta process where some of the front runners and certainly we see transport files here would be able to advance uh, uh, faster than the entire package because, of course, uh, we have some very... Uh, uh, crucial elements in it, Renewable Energy Directive, very, very, very sensitive Energy Taxation Directive, which will also require unanimity, ETS extension, some major, major elements of the whole package. And uh, I just, uh, I, I really believe that at some point there will be parts of it, sub packages uh, moving ahead. And then hopefully in uh, not so distant future, we will see the whole package uh, reaching completion. Okay. And, and it is really a breakfast buffet of legislative proposals covering everything. I just wonder from your perspective, Mark. More of a gala dinner. <laughs> I wonder, Marco, from your perspective, when you look at, um, at the road haulage market, is it a, it's a complex package, is it a good package, and do you think the alternative fuels infrastructure regulation, let's call it AFIA from now on, is that, uh, is that appropriate for the needs of the industry to green up quickly by setting out the necessary charge points and well, hydrogen refueling stations as well? Yeah. Well, thank you, Josh, for the invitation, and thank you to Politico. Um, uh, for the invitation to you to, to join this, this panel discussion on such an important topic for, for all of us, for society, for the economy. Well, uh, we believe that uh, creating a, um, a real and effective ecosystem is essential to success here. And uh, in an ecosystem, all parts, they work together in a synchronized and coherent manner to, to the success of the whole system. So uh, it is not just the truck, it is not just the vehicle, it is not just the transport company, all parts, private stakeholders uh, from the value chain, the supply chain must work together, the public stakeholders as well, to deliver um, uh, an enabling environment. What does enabling environment mean? Well, first of all, of course, uh, available and adequate uh, um, alternative fuel infrastructure. What does adequate mean? Uh, first of all, 
uh, the infrastructure must meet the uh, needs in terms of energy of operators in order to keep delivering and keep carrying on uh, their economic activity. First of all, a fast charging <coughs> structure. Of course, we cannot wait too long time in order to recharge. Uh, third point, the system must be affordable, of course. Uh, let me uh, bring up to the table uh, a historical example. The caravanserai, they were key to the success of the trade route in the past. So I do see the uh, alternative fuel infrastructure together with the safe and secure parking areas as central for uh, sustainability, both in environmental but also social terms in Europe. Um, which fuels? All fuels. I mean, we support energy mix, the technology neutrality, so electricity fine, hydrogen, but don't forget LNG, CNG, bio NGV, or for instance, there was hardly any discussion on a liquid nitrogen. I mean, um, there are more than 900,000 um, um, commercial vehicles below um, um, uh, 3.5 tons uh, uh, for the uh, refrigerated transport, mm. delivering food, delivering pharma, and unfortunately, we all know how much pharma is important today with the COVID crisis. So uh, most of these vehicles, they employ diesel for refrigeration. We are going to launch an exercise in your chart to trial this liquid nitrogen, which is going to reduce up to 90% of their CO2 emissions from this kind of trucks. So that's an example of what we can do, uh, thinking, thinking, I mean, out, out of, the, uh, um, out of the, the circle of the comfort zone. Um, I do, just to uh, come back to you, Marco, but I just wanted to get a perspective from over it, because, of course, your whole business case is on making sure that these things that Marco is talking about can work in practice. What are you at NG anticipating in terms of the split between e-mobility, hydrogen, also other fuels that are necessary for certain kinds of vehicles? So thank you, Josh, and thank you for inviting me uh, both at Politico and also Volvo Trucks for organizing this. Uh, fully agree with Marco, it's a good event, I would say, to present, I would say, what is possible in terms of the infrastructures and what is possible in terms of the energy mix to make sure that we can go uh, fossil-free by 2050. So I fully agree with uh, Marco. Uh, and the question is not about, I would say, going into one single energy. There is no silver bullet. So today, we are talking about electricity, we are talking about hydrogen. I think, Antonio, uh, these are very specific focus uh, that you have, but uh, we should not forget that uh, already today, uh, biogas uh, through the use of uh, natural gas vehicles uh, is already available, already cost competitive, and already adopted by most of the transport companies, uh, especially in, the fr in France. And Looking at hydrogen, it will come soon. It's both on gaseous uh, state, but also on liquid, uh, liquid state. We need to build infrastructure. So at NG, we are talking about building the infrastructures, about supplying this green energy. It's not only about energy, it's really about green energy. So what we have been doing is, for example, for electric mobility, we have been participating, for example, in France to the objective of having this uh, 1 million charging points by uh, next year, especially by uh, developing all the charging infrastructures along the highways, but also uh, at very specific premises, or for example, with the supermarkets and the hypermarkets. What we also have is to have, we have these partnerships, as you described, it's an ecosystem. We have the partnership with the car makers, with the track makers. We are electrifying the dealerships, but we are also electrifying the depots to allow the transport companies to adopt the, the, the electric trucks. But it's not only about that. We are also, for example, operating the first uh, network of uh, biogas and uh, natural gas vehicles uh, in France because, I would say, uh, Minister Jabari didn't talk about this, but uh, it has also been uh, very supportive in terms of the public support for natural gas vehicles in France and how it has also seen a strong development over the years, uh, so uh, with a 20% increase uh, year on year on the use of uh, biogas. And on hydrogen, uh, we are also uh, being among the leaders, uh, for example, in France, because we started uh, the first uh, hydrogen stations for buses, so the transport of persons, it was already two years ago, and we are seeing that uh, it's creating momentum in the market. So we are looking to expand, we are looking to work with, uh, I would say both, I would say the users, transport companies, also the public authorities, and also the truck and car manufacturers, because we need to work as an ecosystem, we need to make it happen. I just want to go back to Maya very, very quickly, and then to you, Antonio, because Maya has to run to, to the meeting in just a few minutes. I have a question from Dolph Villegas on our Slido uh, poll. Do you want to riff on that a little bit? Because 
oftentimes everybody talks in Brussels about being open to any technology, but in effect, the CO2 standards for cars and, and vans has mandated a switch to electrification by 2035. One would imagine when you're, you're looking at what to do about trucks uh, next year, you're considering, or at least the teams inside the commission are uh, mulling doing the same thing there, mandating 100% cut, and that means electrification again. So what about hydrogen, what about e-fuels, what about biofuels in the mix? Is the Commission being, being sufficiently open to alternative uh, methods of uh, propulsion? I would say absolutely so. I don't, I wouldn't uh, phrase it to mandating a switch to electricity. What we are mandating is a move to uh, zero emission mobility. Now, of course, it will be a basket, uh, a basket of measures and uh, as I uh, really needs to insist, nothing will happen overnight. Uh, I think uh, we also need to enlarge uh, the way we uh, look at it. It will really, let's keep in mind, the mobility patterns will change. I do not think we will see the same patterns of car ownership 20 or 25, 30 years from now. A uh, minister has just spoken of... Uh, trains and uh, let's all in particular in this uh, European year of rail let's not uh, forget this very very important and environment friendly mode where a lot of investment both at national and European uh, level will go in uh, let's look at the uh, urban transport and the change the uh, mobility patterns there so all this combined will really bring us to a completely new situation in transport when you just uh, uh, when you just discussed the uh, short haul flights, you mentioned just that uh, what the French government uh, uh, is doing brought about the reduction of only five to six percent. I wouldn't quite say it like that. If we were able to achieve these reductions of five to six percent in various areas as we strive to do, they would combine to this uh, uh, target of nine percent that we are uh, looking at. So in short, we are absolutely technology neutral. What is also crucial, what we are doing a lot, is really to, to invest in innovation, to, to, to have all these new technologies, to also ensure that Europe is a global leader in, in the new hydrogen trucks, in hydrogen boats. We also discussed uh, 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 zero emission uh, flying. So we really, really have a chance to, first of all, achieve uh, zero emissions from transport on our continent, but also to, at the same time, lead the world and to ensure that our technology, our industry really transforms itself. Okay, and of course, before we lead the world, we have to make sure everything is okay in Europe and there's a lot of work to be done to get there. But uh, I know you've got to run. Maya, give our best regards to the Commissioner and uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you and uh, take care, everybody. Bye. Antonio, it's your job to make sure we have the right composite of energies to fuel the vehicles moving forward. What kind of split do you anticipate? I mean, you work for the energy department, so is there going to be enough electricity, for example, to fuel the millions of new electric vehicles on the road? Do we have biofuels in sufficiently clean quantities to fuel the planes, etc.? What's the take from DGNA? Yeah, thanks, Josh. I mean, uh, first of all, um, we see... Um, transport as a part of the bigger energy system is 25% of the final energy consumption. The bigger energy system is 75% of the, of the emissions. So what we want to do is to, to achieve climate neutrality by decarbonizing uh, this energy system in an integrated way by prioritizing energy efficiency, electrification and renewable hydrogen for those uses that cannot be decarbonized in a different manner. No? So this is kind of, of, of our vision that we are trying to to enshrine through the revision of the uh, Renewable Energy Directive. Uh, of course, I mean, this integrated energy system will lead us to uh, a situation where we decarbonize more costs effectively, where we allow the transport system also uh, to, um, to give and play a flexibility role for the, uh, for the energy system uh, through the integration of, uh, of electric vehicles, uh, through the provision of, um, of, of flexibility, through the long-term 
time storage, for example, that, that hydrogen uh, can, um, can deliver. So all this is going to lead to a situation where we are going to set the decarbonize in a more uh, cost-effective way uh, for, um, for the benefit of the, uh, of the final user. Now, um, uh, on, on specifically on, on your question, I mean, how are we going to power all this, um, all this amount of energy we are going to need? So this is going to be a challenge. I mean, for example, I mean, our <laughs> forecast for, for, for solar energy is to triple the, um, the installation of, of solar energy in the EU from uh, the current 140 gigawatts of installed solar to around 450 uh, gigawatts uh, in 2030. So this is huge. This needs to, um, to power both the electrification of end uses, but also the, the build-up of, uh, of renewable hydrogen. So we need to be very careful about the way we do it. We need to, as I said, prioritize efficient uh, solutions, which sometimes uh, means electrification uh, for, uh, for some uses, for some transport uses, or for some industry uses. In other cases, it means, um, it means, um, it means hydrogen. What's the main barrier from from the uh, energy side to, to, to deliver on, 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 on this amount of, of new renewable power which is needed to power the energy transition. Well, permitting, for example. Permitting is one of the, of the bigger barriers we are facing. I mean, some uh, projects uh, take uh, between four and seven years to, uh, to get built and to be delivered. So we are trying to accelerate that through implementation of the current renewables um, directive. Uh, we are going to issue uh, guidance to member states in the course of 2022 to try to uh, speed up this, this, this permitting uh, and, and, and this implementation that will help to, to deliver the green energy we need to power the energy system. Over it, I hear the complaints constantly from car makers and producers of charge points that it can take 12 to 24 months sometimes to get distribution service operators to hook up a street, a new street charge point. This must be a huge frustration for you. Is, is that an experience that you have or is there anything faster you can do to make these things happen? Well, un unfortunately, I would say we are uh, dependent on the fact that uh, each uh, distribution company is making, I would say, the connection, making sure that you can activate it safely. What we do is that, for sure, we experience it, but uh, uh, we usually, I would say, plan this to make sure that we can deliver as fast as possible the, the charging installation, especially at the bus depot, uh, at the bus or the truck depot. When you look at heavy duty um, vehicles, uh, it needs much more energy. So we will talk uh, maybe about a megawatt charging. So it's beyond what we can provide today in terms of high power charging. So we need, I would say, to reinforce the grid to be able to bring all this power to make it available to uh, the depot and to make sure that um, uh, the truck or the bus can uh, recharge in a very short time frame. On this, uh, I think that uh, you will have, uh, I guess, uh, also Antonio, uh, some actions, I would say, to pass the message to make sure that the distribution companies make sure that they act as reasonable prudent operators, but then make sure that they can deliver as fast as possible all the reinforcements that are necessary onto the grids. One more thing is that I would say uh, we think that we need a lot of energy to bring at one point. Uh, the thing is uh, what we have been looking at, and especially uh, through some studies from the local distribution operators, uh, we are not obliged, I would say, to uh, um, size the infrastructures or to upgrade it to make sure that we can answer to the peak demand. Because today we have smart intelligent systems that allow us to schedule and plan, I would say, the, 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 char the charging and the loading of the different vehicles, especially when you have many different fleet of vehicles that are at, uh, connected at the same um, location into the grid. And by having all the uh, digital technologies that we can provide, and it's also about innovation, uh, we can make sure that we size correctly, I would say, the grid to accept um, these new fleets of vehicles, but also to provide the energy safely. And Last but not least, I think that uh, next step will be, uh, as you uh, mentioned, uh, Antonio, to be able to use the battery of the vehicle to support the grid, because it's not only about storing the energy to use it for mobility, but it's also, when it's not used in terms of the battery, use, using it, I would say, to make sure that the grid is stable and that you can provide ancillary services to the grid. 
Understood. That, that's a really interesting kind of breakthrough point that you talk about in terms of uh, vehicles also being able to plug in and provide energy back. But Marco, very sorry to interrupt you earlier, and that was a very evocative comparison to the old trade routes and the level of revolution we're seeing in the industry now when you talk about the infrastructure that's needed to make sure trucks and heavy-duty vehicles can still crisscross Europe and deliver the goods. The socio-economic socio factors are obviously big in play here as well. You have a lot of truckers that live in Central and Eastern Europe. There is less public support there for rolling out the charging infrastructure. To what extent does this dynamic need to be evened out? Can the EU play a role here in funding a lot more infrastructure in Central Europe than it does in the West, for example? Well, the economic aspect is key, of course. Um, <coughs> we need to be reminded that the 80% uh, of the road haulage internal market is composed by macro, uh, small and medium companies, and they have a high degree of specificity. They have limited uh, uh, financial resources, limited human resources. So uh, it is no secret that they will have to, uh, uh, to get uh, financial support from the public institutions, financial institutions. Green finance will be key advisory services from, from, from public institutions and also from uh, umbrella organizations. It will be also our role, the role of associations like UETR, to raise awareness of the importance of the, uh, the transition uh, towards Green Deal objectives and, of course, to, to provide advisory services. Um, unfortunately, due to what we are experiencing today, we all know how uh, uh, unpredictable the world is. We had the COVID crisis, we have the COVID crisis, we will have very likely the COVID crisis. Uh, there is an increase of energy prices, and in some countries the, the sector is really asking for urgent measures from the governments. Uh, we have unfortunately extremely serious structural challenges like the shortage of drivers in the EU. There are roughly uh, half a million drivers missing in, in the EU. So, I mean, we need to find people delivering goods uh, until in, we don't know when, 20. 30, 2040, 2045, 100% uh, automated trucks will deliver goods all over the EU. So we need to bear in mind the specificity of SMEs. What we will need is uh, binding targets for in terms of CO2 emissions limit, fine. But what we see is that there is a need as well for binding targets for the infrastructure and binding targets for investments. And other point is a transition pathway addressing specifically SMEs will also be needed. So every time we'll have the implementation of the system, we will have to conduct an SME impact assessment to make sure that eventually the system will be affordable, uh, workable, practical. Uh, coming back to the title of this panel session, uh, from words to action, I'd like to mention the etymology of the word pragmatism from Greek pragma, which means action. This is what we need in a realistic manner. And I wanted, I think you alluded to it there, but the costs of upgrading, we talk all the time about purchase premiums and subsidies for families to switch to electric or uh, clean vehicles. What about companies to switch to clean trucks? That's a very, very big investment. Is there enough support from governments to make that happen or does this need to be massively improved too? Well, um yeah, you, <laughs> well, yourself, Mark. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, a few comments from, from, from Marcel. Well, first of all, uh, the um, um, investments in green projects are riskier for SMEs. So, indeed, we will need financial support for scrapyard schemes, for renewable <coughs> the fleet, for instance. Or, I mean, it is not just the fuels. Uh, there are many, many practices put in, uh, uh, put in place by, by smaller companies, like, you know, eco-driving, uh, like the, uh, the, uh, the employment of, of aerodynamic trucks, or, for instance, relying upon Co-modality, I mean, let's not forget the co-modality. We support modal shift, provided that modal shift and the use of other modes of transport will be effective and will, meet, will be able to meet the real needs of the real economy, just in time, just in time, just in time principle. Understood, fair point, Antonio. There's a lot of fears in the, in the transport industry at large that this is very much a zero-sum game, that the more biofuels you make available for aviation, for example, you take away from decarbonizing other sectors such as shipping, road transport. Is this the real struggle when you are getting down to A, writing the legislation, and then B, trying to force member countries to go in a certain way, that you're having to apportion out resources in an efficient manner? So you can't set higher sustainable aviation fuel uh, blending targets because there's not enough clean biofuels available for the industry uh, to, to be used in shipping and road transport too. Yeah, I think, I mean, there is, should I? Or? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. For you, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think as 
someone said earlier, I mean, there is no, there is no silver bullet. I think we, we have a range of solutions that we need to use to decarbonize the different transport modes. And, and this is not about, I mean, the EU mandating exactly uh, which uh, type of fuel should be used in which transport mode, but creating the conditions and the criteria for, 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 for this to happen and, and for the market to, uh, to deliver on that. As, as I said earlier, at the end of the day, I think every fuel has, uh, I think, its transport mode or its range of transport modes where it can play uh, a role. I mean, we see electrification as a very important uh, solution for, um, for, for, for passenger vehicles, for, for, uh, for, for, for road transport. We see uh, electrofuels, e-fuels and advanced biofuels as a, as a very um, key solution for, for those uh, modes that are more difficult to electrify. And, and here I'm, I'm speaking about uh, aviation, I'm speaking about uh, maritime, I'm speaking to, to a certain extent about, um, about heavy duty. And of course, there is a range of, of grey areas in between where, I mean, the, the different, um, the different um, fuels will compete to uh, deliver the, the best solution. Here, I think affordability is, is absolutely uh, key. I mean, we cannot get it wrong. We cannot use something which is extremely expensive for, for something for which we have a, a cheaper solution because at the end of the day we will pay it. I think the focus and, and the policy focus now, um, and I'll take the, the example of, of, of hydrogen, is to, 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 to make the uh, technology available at the costs and at the volumes that, that we need to, uh, to play an active role in climate neutrality. And, 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 and if we do things in the right way, for example, renewable hydrogen now is way more expensive than, than, than fossil hydrogen. If we do things in the right way, both in the way we supply that renewable electricity to the electrolyzers, in the way we produce this renewable hydrogen, then we might be in a situation around 2030 where this hydrogen is already cost competitive with fossil hydrogen. And I think that's, that's the real ambition. And that's why we need to think uh, in a holistic way, look at the whole value chain and, 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 and try to, 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 to have solutions that work uh, starting by the short term, but also in the in the long term. Huh? So we have a question on Slido. It's for an anonymous uh, person, perhaps in our audience here or, or watching online on the stream. It's very direct. So I'm going to put it straight to you, Antonio. Um, any views from the panelists, you basically, uh, on the low ambition for transport fuels towards 2030? Uh, only 13% uh, greenhouse gas cut cast in the red proposal. That doesn't sound like a lot, does it? I have to, to disagree with that. I think if you, if you look at the ambition of the current proposal, this 13% in emission reduction by, by, by 2030, uh, which is on the table now, is uh, doubling the ambition of the current Red 2, the 2018 uh, Red 2 agreed by co-legislators uh, three, uh, three years ago and which is being transposed by, by member states. I mean, if we use the, the same accounting method to trans of, of the current Red 2 to translate this minus 13% target, we uh, end up in uh, around 28% <coughs> Uh, renewables in the transport sector, which is uh, double of the current target of 14 uh, renewables uh, in the in the transport sector we have in the in the current renewables directive. Okay, so over it, we, we've heard a lot about the the malevolent force of the of the European Commission, always working for the the best of the 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 industry at large, but. Let me try to start a fight between you two now. Are they, are they doing enough? And what should they have done differently in the Fit for 55 package to make your life easier? Well, I, I won't be able to fight with Antonio because <laughs> we, we, we have been working together. And I would just say that it's a matter of an ecosystem. So it's not about starting a fight. It's a matter of uh, getting uh, aligned uh, on the, both the targets and uh, how, how to achieve them. So Marco is part, uh, I would say, also the conversation. And also, we discussed about the tracks and the car manufacturers and also part uh, of the conversation. So to say that it all can always be different, because uh, I would say, like many things, uh, we have to make a proposal. We have, I would say, to have this conversation also at the national level, making sure that each of, I would say, the country uh, can make it um, in terms of the development, but also can make it acceptable. I think that acceptability and, uh, in my meaning, affordability for, I would say, our customers, it will be your users, and it will be also the customers of the truck and vehicle manufacturers, is essential. We have to define the destination. 
Now we need, I would say, to walk down this path. How do we, I would say, walk down this path? I think we need, I would say, to get the support on everyone. And uh, we discussed a lot about the energy mix. We discussed a lot about the trajectory. We discussed about, a lot about the benefits that it will bring. We are all convinced of this. What we have is that for, for the users, for the transport companies that will operate it, and I fully agree with you, Marco, regarding the SMEs, it's very different when you, have, when you are a big fleet, big operator, you have 200, I would say, uh, trucks, 1,000 trucks, 2,000 trucks, it's, you can't afford, I would say, to convert, to test, to try to make sure that you are making the right choice. For a small company that is just operating on five or 10 trucks, it's very difficult. And I think that we should bring uh, all the support that we can, I would say, to all the users who, are, who can be, I would say, convinced by themselves to adopt uh, the solutions. We are making available the solutions. You are creating the framework so that the solutions can be operated. We are working to make sure that the user can adapt then. And I think that what is important is that the user are very convinced and are not forced to, uh, to use them. So the best of friends. Yeah, Antonio, were you raising your hand to... No, no, no. Uh, I'm, okay. <laughs> I'm listening. So, Marco, I have, I have obviously failed to, to get any uh, fight going there. What do you need from the European Commission to make sure that the, the road haulage industry in Europe is, continues to be successful? It's facing, as you mentioned earlier, structural, profound challenges, not least in workforce, also in the price of energy. What do you need from the European Commission to make uh, the transition work? Uh, well, the, um, uh, first of all, uh, the um, um, possibility for uh, uh, road haulers, for operators, to be able to rely upon uh, an available uh, and affordable uh, uh, framework. Um, and in case uh, um, uh, of the uh, uh, FIT 455 uh, package finally adopted, we will need to rely upon workable options. Uh, in particular, the uh, uh, provision of um, uh, alternative fuels infrastructure will have to be synchronized with any other uh, uh, elements of the package uh, in the future. So there will be work to be done together with the other EU institutions to make sure that uh, the, the framework will be there. And as I said before, a clear transitional pathway from the EU policymakers. And second point, level playing field. Uh, road transport is mobile. Uh, by default, okay? So in principle, there are no borders for transport operators. So we cannot have two or three different Europe's Europe à la carte, like they say in French. So we need to rely upon the same uh, uh, capacity of the infrastructure all <coughs> over the EU. Let's start from the TNT core, let's start from the, uh, from the urban nodes, but actually we need the same level of capacity and the same level of infrastructure all over Europe. I know it is challenging, but actually this is what we need as operators, as those delivering goods from one point of Europe to the other. Very good points. Just want to go to another one of our questions. Ursula Stefanovic uh, asks, perhaps this is a good one for you over it, uh, how do you view the possible role of road charging in promoting zero emission vehicles? I guess that's alluding again to the chicken and egg dilemma. Is it the case that you have to take the hit as an energy company in rolling out the charging infrastructure and then everyone sees it working and then they start buying the vehicles? Is that how it, it, it should work now? And does that mean you guys are going to have to take investments that maybe don't have an immediate profit? Well... Uh, we are taking positions, uh, for example, I talked about uh, the position by what, that we are taking uh, along the French highways. Huh? So uh, um, having, I would say, the corridors being electrified, uh, putting high power charging, uh, it's not, I would say, the type of business model which is quite, I would say, uh, obvious today. Um, it was not at all in the past, but we are taking the risk of uh, making this type of investment because we see, I would say, that the market is developing and that the car makers are also um, providing an offer and that the demand, I would say, is coming, uh, is coming for this. So it's not about, I would say, having an infrastructure that will be idle and stand and wait, I would say, for the demand to come up. It's really working together. For example, what we do uh, as NG, we have a, a partnership uh, with uh, financial institutions that do leasing of electric vehicles, and we bundle together um, in an offered package, uh, I would say, both the electric vehicle, the charging, and also the ramming capabilities to be able to use the different networks that, that, that you can find. So this is what we do. We are also in talks with uh, some of the truck manufacturers to go beyond what we do today. I think that uh, what is important is that uh, we are working with them to provide the charging infrastructures uh, at uh, the truck depot. But uh, 
I would say uh, we are serving the fleets right now, but the fleets need, I would say, to serve their own customers along in different corridors. And uh, the idea is uh, beyond having on-site at the depot the charging infrastructures, we are also working with the truck manufacturers to look at the possibility to implement charging, uh, high power charging infrastructures at very key locations where you can make sure that during their missions, uh, the transport companies will be able to charge there and will be able to do their day-to-day -day job. And w which uh, truck manufacturers are you working with? Uh, we have been working with uh, one from the Nordics and one from, uh, from Germany. And uh, we, are be, uh, we are also uh, looking, I would say, forward to, uh, to work with uh, some other who are the, the main players. Uh, I cannot talk about it now, but uh, we are oh, having a serious conversation. You can feel entirely comfortable. Yeah, you we are just between us, it. so uh, yeah. nobody's listening to us. <laughs> So let, let's spend a few minutes talking specifically about the, the timeline here and what we need to do now, or what the, the co-legislators need to do now to get these things into law. We talk a lot about pace, about having to move quickly. Marco, when you look at the 5055 package, do you think that we should just try to get the final text passed as quickly as possible so there's certainty for the industry? Or do you think that it's better now that everyone takes a long look and makes necessary changes to AFIA or to other proposals and gets what, what you would say the right cocktail of measures? Uh, well, that's a very good question. Uh, we need to be ambitious but pragmatic at the same time. So uh, um, uh, the priority here is to, to get certainties. And the only way to get certainties is to, uh, to, to know that the infrastructure is there. Once we have the infrastructure, uh, you referred before to the chicken and egg situation, fine. But we need to start from somewhere. So uh, um, the, the infrastructure must be prioritized. And, uh, and then the rest, the rest may, may follow. So uh, the uh, working together with the other uh, institutions to make sure that all the, the pieces of this puzzle will fit together, again, in a pragmatic and realistic manner, because actually it is a transition here. Um, if, we, uh, if we do not do the right decision, if we do not uh, uh, um, get the right rules now, I mean, the companies will be a factor in the years to come and transport companies that have an impact on the supply chain, on the real economy, and on society as a whole. So it's, we are going towards a new transport, we are going towards a new world, but we need to make sure that we're going to take the right decision for the years to come. So do you want to make sure that, um, that Minister Jabari gets, if it doesn't happen in December already with the Slovenians, that we have an alternative fuels infrastructure regulation? If I understand you guys correctly, that basically is perhaps the most important single piece of legislation in the whole package for, for the road haulage industry. Do you need a general approach on that in the first six months of next year, so at least everyone knows what's going to happen? Or are you willing to spend a bit more time to make changes to the proposal? Marco? Okay. Um, well, the, um, it's a kind of uh, um, um, it's a trade-off <coughs> here. Uh, let's not forget the social dimension as well. Uh, w if we're working in silos, it's not good. So the, uh, the the road transport sector is. I mean, there is um, an environmental side, the social side. We need to make sure that the companies will be able to to uh, um, to, uh, to operate in a in a in a sustainable and profitable uh, environment as well because actually the, uh, there are many, many issues in terms of social conditions, uh, um, um, uh, fair competition all over the EU. So let's address all these things together. Otherwise, we risk to have hasty moves, and then eventually the companies will be impacted. As I said before, if we are impacted, question, for instance, what about the, the, the raise of transportation costs? This will happen, yes or no? We need to uh, provide a, a clear assessment of this, because actually, if there will be no chance to, to address the, the raise of costs, maybe this, this could be upon the, the final consumers and this is not good for the real economy. Antonio. I think we need to strike the right balance here. I think speed of adoption of the package is essential, but we cannot do it at the expense of uh, lowering the, uh, the, the level of ambition. So I think this is something uh, extremely uh, important uh, for us. I think we have um, no time to lose. I mean, we are doubling uh, the renewable energy share um, in, in one go. So if it takes a lot of time, 
uh, there will be difficulties for member states to implement. But at the same time, I mean, we cannot we cannot lower the ambition because we need to adopt it tomorrow. So I think we need to take things uh, cautiously in that regard. I think the point on, on coordination of the package is essential. I think we have 12 pieces of legislation. So we need to, to make sure that we, we ensure that the, the, the interlinkages uh, are kept and, 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 and the level of ambition is kept across the package. For example, in terms of charging infrastructure, I mean, I fear it's very relevant, but there are provisions on, on, on charging infrastructure as well in the Renewable Energy Directive on the role that e-mobility can play into the overall energy system. So the whole thing needs to, to, to lead to uh, a, a, a consistent uh, solution uh, after co-decision okay. as quickly as possible. <clears throat> And just before we go to other it, to, to close out our panel discussion today, we have another very direct question for you, Antonio, on a Slido. Um, why does RED not set long-term targets for transport fuels? There's nothing beyond 2030, for example. It, you know, now would be the time to set a pathway to carbon neutrality. Would you not agree? That's for me. Yeah, that's for you. Yeah, so I think the... The fifth of 55 package and, and, and red two defines targets for 2030. So that's that's the focus of of, of, of the of, of the package, and that's why we are targeting 2030 to achieve the 55 percent emission reduction uh, in 2030. But it doesn't mean that this is not uh, related to 2050. I mean, all this is based on the the climate target plan, all the modeling that the Commission have done on what's the best pathway to achieve climate neutrality by 2050. And the numbers we are proposing for, for 2030 are the points we need to achieve uh, in 2030 to uh, be consistent with the long-term ambition. So I think everything is, is coordinated and everything is pointing in that direction. Uh, of course, that would be the next step in the future to, um, to, 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 to look at beyond 2030, but let's uh, go step by step and settle the, the middle point, which is 2030. And then, of course, let's look beyond 2030 when the moment comes. Uh, when is the moment to start looking beyond 2030? I think the moment uh, we are looking beyond 2030. I mean, as I said, I mean we, we have we have the modeling, we have the, the the ambition, and we know where where we want to get in 2050. We are defining now the middle point in 2030. Once this is settled, that would be the time to to yeah, to, to to look beyond, obviously. But okay. Over it, the final word to you. I'd really like to get your perspective on sequencing. When would you and NG and all your colleagues uh, in Paris really like to see this package, this uh, gala dinner, as Maya put it, of legislation all passed? Uh, is, it, is it better to get it done as quickly as possible? I think we, we, are, we are all willing, I would say, to have a definite targets that are accepted by everyone. And I think that the interlinkage that you described uh, is a very key. So... Do we share, I would say, the same ambition? Do we share the same target? Because if we share them, then we can act an as an ecosystem. So I would say the sooner will be the better. The ambition must be strong, but also all the means and resources that we can give to the different stakeholders to make it happen. I would say, coming back, I would say to your point, so I would say the, 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 the topic of the day is, I would say, from, from words to actions. We have seen that we have been already acting. Your user, Marco, already acting. You are, Antonio, already acting. The truck manufacturers are already delivering the solutions. With the targets that we will receive, I would say we have all the pieces of the puzzle, and we need, I would say, to make sure that we can bring everything together to make it happen, and most importantly, to reach, I would say, the climate goals that we have. Thank you, Overit, and also thank you for not being distracted in what was a very appropriate closing statement by the big um, red numbers that are counting down in front of us. We've reached the end of today's event. Thank you, guys. The, the panel turned into a manal uh, in the end, which isn't ideal, but I think we still had a very enthusiastic conversation nevertheless. Um, yeah, if you could all thank uh, the guys for joining us today on the panel. I think we, we covered a lot of ground in a relatively short space of time with our one-on-one -on -one interview and with the panel today, um, specifically about the level of ambition and how we get to 2050 and what kind of policies we need to move on uh, immediately and also through the French presidency early next year. want to thank our audience, all you guys in the room with us now. Thank you for coming. Also, those watching online, it was great to have you. Thanks, of course, to Volvo Trucks for making this event possible. Um, you can, of course, send in your reviews and your feedback to live at politico.eu. 
EU, though I'd encourage you to be kind. Uh, check our website for event updates in the future. Of course, there's a stream of energy and climate events, not least the Sustainable Future Summit, which gets started on November the 30th. You can find out all the details on the political website. And that's all the notes I have for today. So thank you, guys. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Josh.